When one's sexual fantasies or desires begin to affect us or others in unwanted or harmful ways, they can be classified as abnormal. This lecture covers the range of human sexual thoughts, feelings, and actions that are listed in the DSM-5 as sexual dysfunctions and paraphilic disorders. Sexual norms have changed over time. They have also changed in conjunction with advances in technology, the rise of AIDS, and the aging population. Culture also influences attitudes and beliefs about sexuality. Some cultures view sexuality as an important part of well-being and pleasure, while others view it only as a means of procreation. With regard to sex drive, compared to women, men report thinking about sex, masturbating, and desiring sex more often, as well as desiring more sexual partners and having more sexual partners. Women tend to be more ashamed of flaws in their appearance compared to men, and this can interfere with their sexual satisfaction. For women, sexuality appears to be more closely tied to relationship status and social norms than for men. Women tend to think about their sexual symptoms in terms of relationship problems, while men are more likely to think about their sexuality in terms of power. Kaplan identified four phases of the human sexual response cycle. The first is desire. In this phase, a sexual interest or desire, often associated with sexually arousing fantasies or thoughts, is experienced. Next, in the excitement phase, men and women experience pleasure and increased blood flow to the genitalia. In men, this flow of blood to tissue produces an erection of the penis. In women, blood flow creates enlargement of the breasts and changes in the vagina, such as increased lubrication. In the orgasm phase, sexual pleasure peaks, usually through ejaculation in the male and contraction of the outer walls of the vagina in the female. A sense of relaxation and well-being is usually experienced following an orgasm. This is called the resolution phase. More recent research has questioned the separation of the desire and excitement phases for women. For women, subjectively reported and measured physiological arousal have little correlation. However, for men, they tend to be highly correlated. In the DSM-5, sexual dysfunctions are divided into three categories. First, those involving sexual desire, arousal, and interest. Second, orgasmic disorders. And third, sexual pain disorders. Separate diagnoses are provided for men and women. The diagnostic criteria for sexual dysfunction state that they should be persistent and recurrent and that they should cause clinically significant distress or problems with functioning. A diagnosis of sexual dysfunction is not made if the problem is believed to be caused entirely by another medical or psychological disorder. Additionally, sexual concerns that arise due to severe relationship distress, such as partner abuse, should not be diagnosed as dysfunctions. DSM-5 criteria for diagnosis of sexual dysfunction are specific in the requirement that symptoms persist for at least six months. The DSM-5 contains three disorders relevant to sexual interest, desire, and arousal. Female sexual interest Arousal disorder refers to persistent deficits in sexual interests, sexual fantasies, or urges, biological arousal, or subjective arousal. For men, the DSM-5 diagnoses consider sexual interest and arousal separately. Male hypoactive sexual desire disorder refers to deficient or absent sexual fantasies and urges, and erectile disorder refers to failure to maintain or attain an erection through completion of the sexual activity. It is important to rule out biological explanations for these symptoms for both men and women. For example, laboratory tests of hormone levels are a routine part of assessment for postmenopausal women. Among people seeking treatment for sexual dysfunctions, more than half complain of low desire. Diagnoses related to low sexual desire became more common among men and women seeking treatment from the 1970s to the 1990s. Women are more likely than men to report at least occasional concerns about their level of sexual desire. Postmenopausal women are two to four times as likely as women in their 20s are to report low sexual desire. On the other hand, older women are less likely to be distressed over this low sexual desire. Occasional symptoms of erectile disorder are the most common sexual concern among men, with rates ranging from 13 to 28 percent, depending on the country. 
Male erectile disorder increases greatly with age, with as many as 15% of men in their 70s reporting erectile disorder, and as many as 70% reporting occasional erectile dysfunction. As with other sexual dysfunctions, the DSM-5 includes separate diagnoses for problems in achieving orgasm for women and men. Female orgasmic disorder refers to the persistent absence or reduced intensity of orgasm after sexual excitement. Women have different thresholds for orgasm. Although some have orgasms quickly without much clitoral stimulation, others need pro prolonged clitoral stimulation. Given this, it is not surprising that about one-third of women report that they do not consistently experience orgasms with their partners. Female orgasmic disorder is not diagnosed unless the absence of orgasms is persistent and troubling. About two-thirds of women report that they have faked an orgasm, and most say that they did so to try to protect their partner's feelings. Many men are unaware, or at least don't report, that their partners don't achieve orgasms. Women's problems reaching orgasm are distinct from problems with sexual arousal. Many women achieve arousal during sexual activity, but then do not reach orgasm. Indeed, laboratory research has shown that arousal levels while viewing erotic stimuli do not distinguish women with orgasmic disorder from those without orgasmic disorder. The DSM-5 includes two orgasmic disorders of men, premature ejaculation, defined by ejaculation that occurs too quickly, and delayed ejaculation disorder, defined by persistent difficulty in ejaculating. Although researchers do not know how many men meet formal diagnostic criteria, 20 to 30 percent of men reported premature ejaculation, and 10 to 20 percent of men reported that they had trouble reaching orgasm for at least a couple of months in the past year in one survey. Although brief periods of symptoms may be fairly common, less than 3% of men acknowledge symptoms of premature ejaculation lasting for six months or more. In the DSM-5, Genitopelvic pain penetration disorder is defined by persistent or recurrent pain during intercourse. Some women report that the pain starts at entry, whereas others report pain only after penetration. A first step in making this diagnosis is ensuring that the pain is not caused by a medical problem such as an infection, or in women, by a lack of vaginal lubrication due to low desire or postmenopausal changes. Although sexual pain disorders can be diagnosed in both men and women, we focus on women because it is extremely rare for men to seek treatment for these concerns. Most women with this sexual pain disorder experience sexual arousal and can have orgasms from manual or oral stimulation that does not involve penetration. Women who experience pain when attempting sexual intercourse show normative sexual arousal of films of oral sex, but not surprisingly, their arousal declines when they watch a depiction of intercourse. Prevalence rates for occasional symptoms of pain during intercourse among women have been estimated to range from 10 to 30 percent. This is a very common complaint heard by gynecologists. Biological causes of sexual dysfunctions can include diseases such as atherosclerosis, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and spinal cord injury. Low levels of testosterone or estrogen, heavy alcohol use before sex, chronic alcohol dependence, and heavy cigarette smoking. Certain medications such as antihypertensive drugs and especially selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SSRI, antidepressant drugs such as Prozac and Zoloft, have effects on sexual function, including delayed orgasm, decreased libido, and diminished lubrication. Among older men who develop erectile dysfunction, vascular conditions often are involved. Beyond these general considerations, some biological factors may be specific to certain sexual dysfunctions. As one example, laboratory-based evidence suggests that men with premature ejaculation are more sexually responsive to tactile stimulation than men who don't have this problem. Perhaps then, their penises are more sensitive, causing them to ejaculate more quickly. Some sexual dysfunctions can be traced to rape, childhood sexual abuse, or other degrading encounters. Sexual abuse during childhood is associated with diminished arousal and desire, and among men, with double the rate of premature ejaculation. 
Beyond the role of traumatic experiences, it is important to consider the benefits of positive experiences. Many people with sexual problems lack knowledge and skill because they have not had opportunities to learn about their sexuality. Broader relationship problems often interfere with sexual arousal and pleasure. For women, concerns about a partner's affection appear particularly correlated with sexual satisfaction. For people who tend to be anxious about their relationships, sexual problems may exacerbate underlying worries about relationship security. As one might expect, people who are angry with their partners are less likely to want sex. Even in couples who are satisfied in other realms of their relationship, poor communication can contribute to sexual dysfunction. For any number of reasons, including embarrassment, worry about the partner's feelings, or fear, one lover may not tell the other about preferences, even if a partner is engaging in unstimulating or even aversive behaviors. Depression and anxiety increase the risk of sexual dysfunctions. People who are depressed are more than twice as likely as non-depressed people to have a sexual dysfunction. People with panic disorder, who are often fearful of physical sensations like rapid heart rate and sweating, are also at risk for sexual dysfunction. Anxiety and depression are particularly core morbid with sexual pain and with disorders involving low sexual desire and arousal. Beyond evidence that depression and anxiety are detrimental, several studies suggest that low general physiological arousal can interfere with specific sexual arousal. One study examined the role of arousal by assigning women to exercise or no exercise conditions and then asking women to watch erotic films. Consistent with the positive role of higher arousal, exercise facilitated sexual arousal. No wonder then that exhausted couples turning to sex after a full day of work, parenting, socializing, and other roles can encounter sexual problems. Too much stress and exhaustion clearly impede sexual functioning. Negative cognitions, such as worries about pregnancy or AIDS, Negative attitudes about sex or concerns about the partner interfere with sexual functioning. Cognitions concerning sexual performance are particularly important. Consider the idea that variability in sexual performance is common. A stressful day, a distracting context, a relationship concern, or any number of other issues may diminish sexual responsiveness. The key issue may be how people think about their diminished physical response when it happens. One theory is that people who blame themselves for decreased sexual performance will be more likely to de develop recurrent problems. In a test of the role of self-blame in erectile dysfunction, one study asked 52 male participants to watch erotic videos. During the videos, their sexual arousal was measured. Regardless of their actual arousal, the men were given false feedback that the size of their erection was smaller than that typically measured among aroused men. Men were randomly assigned to receive two different explanations for this false feedback. In the first, they were told that the films did not seem to be working for most men, an external explanation. In the second, they were told that the pattern of their responses on questionnaires about sexuality might help explain that low arousal, an internal explanation. After receiving this feedback, the men were asked to watch one more film. The men who were given an internal explanation reported less arousal and also showed less physiological evidence of arousal during this film than those given an external explanation. These results then support the idea that people who blame themselves when their body doesn't perform will experience diminished subsequent arousal. Whereas men may worry about their erection, women can suffer from intrusive thoughts about their attractiveness. Many women struggle with negative intrusive thoughts about their weight or appearance during sex. Beyond concerns about performance and attractiveness, Masters and Johnson found in one study that many of their sexually dysfunctional patients had learned negative views of sexuality from their social and cultural surroundings. For example, some religions and cultures may discourage sexuality for the sake of pleasure, particularly outside marriage. Other cultures may disapprove of sexual initiative or behavior among women, other than for the sake of procreation. One female patient suffering from a lack of sexual desire, for example, had been taught as she was growing up 
not to look at herself naked in the mirror, and that intercourse was reserved for marriage and then only to be endured for the purposes of having children. Guilt about engaging in sexual behavior appears to vary by cultural group and can inhibit sexual desire. Treatments for sexual dysfunction include anxiety reduction, directed masturbation, cognitive procedures to change attitudes and thoughts, skills and communication training, couples therapy, and medications and physical treatment. In the DSM-5, the paraphilic disorders are defined by recurrent sexual attraction to unusual objects or sexual activities lasting at least six months. In other words, there is a deviation, or a para, in what the person is attracted to, a philia. DSM differentiates the paraphilic disorder is based on the source of arousal. For example, providing one diagnostic category for people whose sexual attractions are focused on inanimate objects and another diagnostic category for people whose sexual attractions are focused on children. Surveys have shown that many people occasionally fantasize about some of the activities we will be describing. For example, 50% of men report voyeuristic fantasies of peeping or at unsuspected naked women. In a large group of people who volunteered for a study of sexuality and health, 7.7% .7 reported that they had been aroused by spying on others having sex, and 3.1% reported that they had been aroused by exposing their genitalia to a stranger at least once during their lifetime. By 2007, the there were 381 Yahoo groups with a name related to sexual fetishes. As some of these behaviors become more common, considerable debate has emerged about whether it is appropriate to diagnose some of the paraphilias. In 2009, the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare decided to remove some of the paraphilic diagnoses. Fetishistic disorder, sexual sadism disorder, sexual masochism disorder and transvestic disorder are no longer included in their psychiatric classification system. The board reasoned that many people practice variant sexual behavior safely with consenting adult partners and do not experience any distress or impairment as a result. The American Psychiatric Association's Sexual and Gender Identity Disorders Work Group recommended retaining these disorders in the DSM-5 but the word disorder is added in the title of these diagnoses to emphasize that these should be diagnosed only when they cause marked distress or impairment or when the person engages in sexual activities with a non-consenting person. Fetishistic disorder is defined by a reliance on an inanimate object or a non-genital part of the body for sexual arousal. A fetish refers to the object of these sexual urges, such as a woman's shoes or feet. The person with fetishistic disorder, almost always a man, has recurrent and intense sexual urges towards these fetishes. And the presence of the fetish is strongly preferred or even necessary for sexual arousal. Clothing, especially underwear, leather, and articles related to feet, stockings, or women's shoes are common fetishes. Beyond non-living objects, some people focus on non-sexual body parts, such as hair, nails, hands, or feet, for sexual arousal. Because there is no evidence to suggest that there is a difference in the etiology or consequences of a boot fetish compared to a foot fetish, the DSM-5 includes a reliance on non-sexual body parts for sexual arousal under the diagnosis of fetishistic disorder. Some carry on their fetishism by themselves in secret by fondling, kissing, smelling, sucking, placing in their rectum, or merely gazing at the adored object as they masturbate. Others need their partner to don the fetish as a stimulant for intercourse. For many, a fetish may never reach a diagnosable level. As examples of diagnosable impairment, though, some become interested in acquiring a collection of the desired objects, and they may even commit burglary week after week to add to their hoard. The person with the fetishistic disorder feels a compulsive attraction to the object. The attraction is experienced as involuntary and irresistible. It is the degree of the erotic focus, the exclusive and very special status the object occupies as a se sexual stimulant, that distinguishes fetishistic disorders from the ordinary attraction that, for example, high heels may hold for heterosexual men in Western cultures. 
The person with a booth fetish must see or touch a boot to become aroused, and the arousal is overwhelmingly strong when a boot is present. The disorder usually begins in adolescence, although the fetish may have acquired special significance even earlier during childhood. People with fetishistic disorder often have other paraphilias such as pedophilic disorder or sexual sadism and masochism disorders. According to the DSM, pedophilic disorder Pedes is Greek for child and philia is Greek for attraction, is the diagnosed when adults derive sexual gratification through sexual contact with prepubertal or pubescent children, or when they experience recurrent, intense, and distressing desires for sexual contact with prepubertal or pubescent children. DSM-5 requires that the offender be at least 18 years old and at least 5 years older than the child. Most men who acknowledge pedophilic disorder report that they use child pornography. As in mo most paraphilias, a strong subjective attraction impels the behavior. Sometimes a man with pedophilic disorder is content to stroke the child's hair, but he may also manipulate the child's genitalia, encourage the child to manipulate his, and less often attempt penile insertion. The molestations may be repeated over a period of weeks, months, or years if they are not discovered by other adults or if the child does not protest. Some people with pedophilic disorder intentionally frighten the child by, for example, killing a pet and threatening further harm if the youngster tells his or her parents. People with pedophilic disorder generally molest children that they know, such as neighbors or friends of the family. Sadly, incidents abound involving scoutmasters, camp counselors, and clergy. Most with pedophilic disorder do not engage in violence other than the sexual act, although when they do, it is often focused of lurid stories in the media. Because overt physical force is seldom used in pedophilic disorder, the child molester often denies that he is actually forcing himself on his victim. Despite molester's distorted beliefs, child sexual abuse inherently involves a betrayal of trust and other serious negative consequences. Incest is listed as a subtype of pedophilic disorder. Incest refers to sexual relations between close relatives from whom marriage is forbidden. It is most common between brother and sister. The next most common form, which is considered more pathological, is between father and daughter. The taboo against incest is virtually universal in human societies, with the notable exception of Egyptian pharaohs who could marry their sisters or other females of their immediate families. In Egypt, it was believed that the royal blood should not be contaminated by that of outsiders. The incest taboo makes sense according to present-day scientific knowledge. The offspring from a father-daughter or brother-sister union have a greater probability of inheriting a pair of recessive genes, one from each parent. For the most part, recessive genes have negative biological defects, such as serious birth defects. The incest taboo, then, has an adaptive evolutionary significance. There's evidence that families in which incest occurs are unusually patriarchal, especially with respect to subservient positions of women to men. Parents in these families also tend to be more neglectful and emotionally distant from their children. Typically, men who commit incest abuse their pubescent daughters, whereas men with non-incestual pedophilic disorder are usually interested in prepubertal children. Consistent with this difference in the age of victims, men who molest children within their family show greater penile arousal to adult heterosexual cues than do men who molest unrelated children. People with pedophilic disorder can be straight or gay, though most are heterosexual. Up to half of all child molestations, including those that take place within the family, are committed by adolescent males. Academic problems are common, as are other criminal behaviors. Most older heterosexual men with pedophilic disorder are or have been married. Psychologically, men with pedophilic disorder demonstrate elevated impulsivity and psychopathy, compared to the general population. These men often meet criteria for comorbid conduct disorder and substance abuse, and molestations are more likely to occur when the person with pedophilic disorder is intoxicated. As with other paraphilic disorders, 
depression and anxiety disorders are also common. Evidence also suggests that men with pedophilic disorder have sexual fantasies about children when their mood is negative, perhaps as a way to cope with their unhappiness. However, having the fantasy appears to increase negative affect. This downward spiral may then contribute to the urge to molest a child. Voyeuristic fantasies are quite common in men, but do not by themselves warrant a diagnosis. Voyeuristic disorder involves an intense and recurrent desire to obtain sexual gratification by watching unsuspecting others in a state of undress or having sexual relations. For some men with this disorder, voyeurism is the, their only sexual activity. For others, it is preferred but not absolutely essential for sexual arousal. The looking, often called peeping, helps the person become sexually aroused and is sometimes essential for arousal. People with voyeuristic disorder achieve orgasm by masturbation, either while watching or later while remembering the peeping. Sometimes the person with voyeuristic disorder fantasizes about having sexual contact with the observed person, but it remains a fantasy. He or she seldom contacts the observed person. A true voyeur, almost always a man, does not find it particularly exciting to watch a woman who's undressing for his benefit. The element of risk seems important, for the voyeur is excited by the anticipation of how the woman would react if she knew he was watching. The prevalence is difficult to assess since most incidences are not reported to the police. Indeed, people with voyeuristic disorder are mo most often charged with loitering rather than peeping itself. Voyeuristic disorder typically begins in adolescence. People who meet cr diagnostic criteria for voyeuristic disorder often have other paraphilias, but they do not tend to have an elevated rate of other mental disorders. Exhibitionistic disorder is a recurrent intense desire to obtain sexual gratification by exposing one's genitals to an unwilling stranger sometimes a child. It typically begins in adolescence. As with voyeuristic disorder, there is seldom an attempt to have an actual contact with a stranger. In one study, persons diagnosed with exhibitionistic disorder reported that they had been arrested for only one out of every 150 incidents. Many exhibitionists masturbate during the exposure. In most cases, there is a de desire to shock or embarrass the observer. The urge to expose seems overwhelming and virtually uncontrollable to the exhibitionist and is apparently triggered by anxiety and restlessness as well as by sexual arousal. Because of the compulsive nature of the urge, the exposures may be repeated often and even in the same place and at the same time of day. At the time of the act, the social and legal consequences are far from the exhibitionist's mind. In the desperation and tension of the moment, they may experience headaches and palpitations and have a sense of unreality. After exposing themselves, exhibitionists tend to flee and feel remorseful. Other paraphilias are very common in exhibitionists, notably voyeuristic and frauderistic disorders. Frauderistic disorder involves the sexually oriented touching of an unsuspecting person. The frauder may rub his penis against a woman's thighs or buttocks or handle her breasts or genitals. These attacks typically occur in places such as a crowded bus or sidewalk that provide an easy means of escape. Frauderistic disorder has not been studied very extensively. It typically occurs along with other paraphilias. Most men who engage in frauderism report doing so dozens of times. Sexual sadism disorder is defined by an intense and recurrent desire to obtain or increase sexual gratification by inflicting pain or psychological su suffering, such as humiliation, on another. Sexual masochism disorder is defined by an intense and recurrent desire to obtain or increase sexual gratification through being subjected to pain or humiliation. Some sadists achieve orgasm by inflicting pain, and some masochists achieve orgasm by being subjected to pain. For others, though, the sadistic and masochistic practices, such as spanking, are just one aspect of sexual activity. The manifestations of sexual masochism disorder are varied. Examples include physical bondage, blindfolding, spanking, whipping, electric shocks, cutting, 
hum humiliation, such as being urinated or defecated on, being forced to wear a dog collar and bark like a dog, or being put on display naked, and taking the role of slave and submitting to orders and commands. Most sadists establish relationships with masochists to derive mutual sexual gratification. Although many people are able to take both dominant and submissive roles, masochists outnumber sadists. Sadists and masochists dick behavior have become more accepted over time. Five to 10% of the population have tried some form of sadomasochistic activity, such as blindfolding one's partner. In major cities, clubs cater to members seeking sadomasochistic relationships. Most people who engage in sadomasochistic behaviors are relatively comfortable with their sexual practices. As sadomasochistic practices have become more common and more openly practiced, there has been some debate about whether these diagnoses should be retained in DSM-5. Many people who engage in sadomasochism appear to be free of distress or impairment and so would not meet criteria for diagnosis. These diagnostic labels were retained because some sadistic and masochistic practices can be dangerous. One particularly dangerous form of masochism, called asphyxophilia, can result in death or brain damage. It involves sexual arousal by restricting breathing, which can be achieved using a noose, a plastic bag, or chest compression. There is also some concern that the diagnosis of sexual sadism disorder is rarely applied in clinical settings. In an unpublished review of over 500 million visits to psychiatrists, gynecologists, urologists, and other physicians, no doctor recorded a diagnosis of sexual sadism disorder. Doctors in clinical settings may not use the diagnosis even when symptoms are present because of worries over stigma. The diagnosis then seems to be applied almost entirely within forensic settings. Sexual sadism and masochism disorders seem to begin in early adulthood. Both these disorders are found in straight and gay relationships. Surveys have found that 20 to 30 percent of members of sadomasochistic clubs are female, and it has been assumed that a similar gender ratio might be true of diagnosable sadism and masochism. Most sadists and masochists lead otherwise conventional lives, and there is some evidence that they are above average in income and educational status. Alcohol abuse is common among sadists. Because the overwhelming majority of people with paraphilic disorders are men, there has been speculation that androgens, hormones like testosterone, play a role. Most psychological theories of the paraphilias involve a set of risk factors. In terms of psychological factors, most dominant models emphasize conditioning experiences, relationship histories, abuse, and cognition. Treatments for paraphilic disorders include strategies to enhance motivation to change, cognitive behavioral treatment, and biological treatment, which includes medications.